Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Eve Zimmerman, director of the Newhouse Center for the Humanities. I will be introducing um, Jay Turner today. Uh, then I will be turning the podium over to Eric Mathis, who's going to be our discussant. Um, so just a brief introduction about um, Jay Turner, Professor of Environmental Studies at Wellesley. Um, Jay is one of our one of our first cohort uh, of Knapp Newhouse Fellows to present in this series. Um, the Knapp Newhouse uh, project grew out of our recognition that the boundaries between humanities and social sciences are increasingly clunky and anachronistic. Jay, for example, is a man who has received funding from both the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, what gives with that, right? Um, equipped with an MA in American Civilization from Brown and a PhD in History of Science from Princeton, plus a certificate in Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy, which he received one year after his PhD, Jay is uh, the epitome of the interdisciplinary scholar. To be an interdisciplinary scholar, one must have breadth of range in terms of interests. Uh, Jay's first book, The Promise of Wilderness, American Environmental Politics Since 1964, I'm quoting here, chronicles the expansion of the federal wilderness system since 1964 and the shift toward a broader agenda for public land reform, unquote. He next published a co-authored book, The Republican Reversal, Conservatives and the Environment from Nixon to Trump. And this work traces, quote, the historical evolution of conservative opposition to environmental reform, the effects of which we live with every single day. Today, in another example of Jay's range, breadth of scholarly interest, you will hear material from his third book, which I, as I understand is tentatively titled, Closing the Circle, Lead Acid Batteries, A Culture of Mobility, and the Future of Sustainability. And this is obviously a book project on uh, the environmental history of batteries. Last but not least, the interdisciplinary scholar must obtain mastery of multiple methodologies in order to communicate widely. Jay's work on batteries demands both a grounding in the history of science, as well as an ear finely tuned to the subtleties of human behavior and the ability to ask and answer questions such as, who has access to power and who does not have access? There's no doubt in my mind that Professor Jay Turner's work, latest work, will check all of those boxes too. Without further ado, I give you Professor Jay Turner. All right. Thank you, Eve, for such a generous introduction. Um, it was really great of you and Olga Shirkov to run the Newhouse Center summer, summer seminar program. And just I mean, for me, this summer working on this project, being able to come up for air and engage with other folks who were doing research and writing and you know working on that every day, it was just uh, it was really welcome. You know, thinking about people that think this is a project that I've been working on for a while, and I've had a lot of help from Wellesley students along the way. It's, um, great to see a Wellesley alum, maybe more than one out there, but hey, Dominique, good to see you and some Wellesley students and lots of folks I don't know as well, some favorite soccer players that I get to play with. Thank you all for coming, especially on such a lovely sunny afternoon. Um, Laura, thanks for putting this whole event together and Eric for getting us started with some commentary and questions. So, gosh, interdisciplinary has really been kind of central to all of my work, as Eve was saying, which I think in practice just means I spend a lot of time walking across campuses because I have to go from one library to the other library or from you know, the political science department over to the ecology department. And that's been a lot of fun over the years. And it's really why I've always been so happy to be teaching in an interdisciplinary environmental studies department. So 
my plan for today is to talk for about 25, 30 minutes, kind of giving you a high level overview of my current research. And I hope that that'll give you just enough of a sense for what I'm working on that we can um, have some interesting discussion and some good questions and hopefully some uh, useful, interesting answers as well. Um, yeah, and, you know, Eve, actually, you bring up a good question. What is the title of this book that I'm working on? I've been working on this book for a while and it's, it's morphed and it's actually morphed more recently because I've expanded it beyond just focusing on lead acid batteries and really working on a project that takes three different battery chemistries as its case studies. And so I'm trying to figure out what the right, right title for it is. And so I'm actually I'm looking for suggestions. And right now my current working title is more or less what the title of this talk is, which is Charged, the History of Batteries and Prospects for a Clean Energy Future. Um, but I'm open to suggestions. So if somewhere along the way I say something, you're like, ah, oh, that, that gives me an idea for a good title for this project. I would welcome your suggestions. So I'm gonna start off with something that came up in the vice presidential debate last night, which is the Green New Deal. And you know, so I expect all of you all have heard a little bit about the Green New Deal over the last year and a half since it was introduced by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Ed Markey. And I'm a big fan of the Green New Deal because it really represents, if we're gonna take the science and the urgency of climate change seriously, the kind of action we need at a federal level to address the problem, right? So the Green New Deal is about a 100% renewable energy future. It's about achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions. It's about building resiliency in our communities and in our infrastructure and repairing and upgrading infrastructure. All of these important uh, energy and environmental goals but it's also important because it's about pairing those goals with important social, um, urgent social priorities, you know, promoting a fair and just transition, creating jobs, green jobs, out of this kind of turn towards a clean energy economy, addressing historic oppression, and doing this in a way, oh, I just jumped forward in my slides, but doing this in a way that links both economic growth and renewable energy with social justice aims as well. And in choosing the title, the Green New Deal, the visionaries were really trying to build on the legacies of the New Deal, right? And they do this explicitly. So what I just popped up a little earlier than I meant to is in the resolution, right? It says that this is gonna be something new uh, in terms of national, social, industrial, and economic mobilization that will be on a scale not seen since World War II and the New Deal. And that's what this historic opportunity is to create these jobs, to bring prosperity to the country and counteract systemic injustices. Now, there's been a lot of praise, a lot of criticism for the Green New Deal, but I think in terms of the praise, right, bringing together environmental goals and social justice goals, you know, as one commentator said, this is what, quote, realistic environmental policy looks like. But as a historian, in that reference to the New Deal, one thing stands out to me about this, which is that if you think about the New Deal of the 1930s under FDR, you think of things like dams and airplanes and building things. And it was about jobs and expanding and trying to right the economy in the aftermath of the Great Depression and uh, you know, build all those power lines and bridges and roads and in the lead up to World War II, manufacturing wartime material. But there's something much more kind of mundane at work here as well, which is that it was also an unprecedented uh, mobilization of just materials, of things like concrete and asphalt and copper and metals. And that's important because just as with the New Deal, the Green New Deal will significantly increase demand for materials. And researchers who have investigated what the consequences of scaling up clean energy, renewable energy sources are, point to a future in which we're going to need a lot more of aluminum, copper, glass for things like wind turbines and electric motors and solar panels. And you know, this has received some attention. There's been some discussion around things like rare earth metals. 
but the fact that moving towards a clean energy energy future is really going to represent, and that's what these graphs show, they compare kind of future demand in 2050, if we scale up a clean energy future, they compare that to 2010 world production. And these are already very intensive industries, and we are talking about massive increases in the amount of materials that we're going to need to realize a clean energy future. So the point that I'm starting here with is that renewable energy technologies may be carbon light, and that's a very good thing, right, if you're concerned about climate change, but they are also materials intensive. And the material intensity of this is a point that's been emitted from discussions about how to achieve net zero emissions and move a Green New Deal forward. Um, as we look out towards 2050. So you may be wondering, you know, what in the world does a historian have to say about the material dimensions of a clean energy future? So let me tell you a little bit about what drew me to this project, because it really came out of my teaching at Wellesley, our intro class that I often teach others teach it as well as a class on climate change. And in that class, we talk about a lot of different things, the science of climate change, um, you know, policy strategies, issues of environmental justice. We talk about energy systems and, you know, both myself, students in that class, you know, often have a lot to say and kind of when I was starting this project about, you know, what's bad with coal-fired power, what the complications are with natural gas, the benefits of wind power or solar power. But everybody had a sense that, you know, batteries were going to play an important role in this you know, this turn towards renewable energy systems to power things like electric cars or to provide um, you know, support load leveling for uh, the electrical system with renewable power on it. But there wasn't a whole lot of knowledge about batteries kind of amongst us. You know, like we knew a lot about coal and about solar, but, you know, like, well, you know, how did the batteries fit in? They were literally a black box. We, you know, students didn't know where they came from or where they went after um, they were used. Yeah, we all knew that they were going to be crucial to this renewable energy future. And most of the research on batteries you know, was by engineers, chemical engineers, material scientists. And so as a historian, I became interested in thinking about what I could say, what I could learn from the history of batteries that could help us think more carefully about the place of batteries and the materials that they depend upon as we move into a renewable clean energy future. And and so right now, kind of looking forward, it's easy to envision a world in which there are going to be a lot more batteries, right? If they're in all of our cars and they're helping stabilize the power supply from all of those renewable energy systems. But from the perspective of a historian, this actually isn't new at all. Really, since the start of the 20th century, batteries, batteries have played an essential role in the systems of communication and transportation and electrification that have been important to um, were important to the 20th century world. And so just to give you a couple of quick examples here, one is that you know, before the electrical grid was built out in the 1920s, 30s, and 1940s, batteries, disposable batteries, kind of the antecedents of the AA battery that you may pry out of that blister pack today, the antecedent to that was used to power telephones in people's homes. And so this is an advertisement for what's now the Rayovac Corporation where they're advertising their telephone batteries. So you, know, you may think it's kind of a novel thing here in the 21st century to be worried about your battery running out on your telephone. But in fact, people at the start of the 20th century, when people were first starting to use telephones, they were also worried that their batteries were gonna run out because they were battery powered at that point. Or, if you go back and you look in 1900, electric cars were as common as gasoline cars were at the time. And the electric cars, like one of the most popular models was the Mark III electric car. It had a top speed of about 12, 13 miles per hour. It had a range of about 35 miles. But interestingly, interestingly these electric cars were often marketed to women. And you can see that in this advertisement for the Baker electric cars because they were um, seen as being safer and cleaner and easier to use. They often featured women in their marketing. Another tidbit from the early history of batteries is, again, when radios were first introduced, in most places there wasn't an electrical grid. So as radios started to stitch the country together, started to bring rural and urban areas together, popular media began to emerge, right? radio programs, 
all of that was happening because of the availability of batteries, which were being used to power early radios um, up until the 1930s in most places, and then even in rural areas up until the 1950s, 1960s, kind of what were called farm radios still ran on batteries. And this is a picture from an advertisement for a battery powered radio. So, you know, thinking about a future where there are more and more batteries, there's a lot to learn about the ways in which batteries actually enabled many of the systems and technologies that we have come to you know, rely upon in the 20th century. So I'm going to shift gears here and talk about how looking at that history, how that's reframed ways of understanding energy history, uh, which I think are important to thinking about the future. So the first topic I want to take up is this idea of batteries as a footnote. Um, there's, there's a whole field out there of energy history, and most of that history focuses on kind of the big prime movers. It's focused on what generated the most energy and was most important uh, kind of over the course of modern history. So this is often kind of a history that follows, you know, the rise of coal and the rise of petroleum and all of these things on energy charts that just go up and up as we use more and more of them. And so what's interesting is that batteries have actually drawn almost no attention from energy historians and they've literally been res relegated to kind of a footnote in energy history. So one part of this project is actually writing batteries in to the history of energy. So that's one important point. Another one that builds off that is that batteries are not important because of the amount of energy they provide. I mean, in fact, they provide very, very little energy relative to something like a you know, coal or a gallon of gasoline. So batteries aren't important because of how much energy they provide. What really makes batteries valuable, both historically and today, is the qualities of that energy. The chemical energy that's stored in a battery is portable, right? You can take it from place to place. It's available instantaneously. And at least at the point of use, it's pollution free. And it's these qualities that explain why batteries are so valuable to us. And it isn't that they provide lots of energy, it's that they provide especially useful energy. And then one more point, which is this idea that I'm calling a culture of mobility. So I think something that became more and more important over the course of the 20th century uh, was the ability to move ourselves and information to communicate um, more easily, more readily. And there's a literature out there kind of looking at the synergy uh, between the mobility of information and the, the mobility of things. And environmentalists have thought about this too, and often they fret more about the impacts, the environmental impacts of moving themselves and things around, right? So traveling and shipping and the energy costs, the carbon costs of doing that. And in contrast to that, there's usually been a lot less attention to the environmental consequences of the mobility of information, communicating, you know, somehow that seems ethereal, something that's um, not grounded in the material. But one of the things that has really fascinated me about batteries is that they remind us that the things that we think of as being most ethereal, like sending a text message or placing a telephone call, are actually made possible by very material things. Um, in this case, the batteries that make those forms of communication possible. And batteries enable those forms of communication in the same way that batteries have played a really critical role in enabling uh, the movement of, of people and things as well. So this batteries provide an interesting perspective into this culture of mobility that links together both forms of mobility in the material world. So these are three kind of concepts that I'm playing around with in this book um, that are important to energy history. And then there's one more that I'll back out here um, because it's not just about energy history, but it's about environmental history, which is a field that I um, trained in, which is you know, thinking about the environmental justice implications of the mining industry and the modern energy economy. And one of the themes that is important to this book is understanding who is bearing the consequences of 
mining the materials over time, recycling the batteries and um, doing the work in these manufacturing plants because often these facilities have been located near poorer communities, communities of color, and increasingly as less of this work is happening in the United States, it's being located in developing countries. So let me talk for a couple of minutes here about the three case studies. So there are three, in my mind, kind of central battery technologies that have been kind of stand out in history. Um, one is the one on the far left here, which is the lead acid battery. The second one is the common disposable battery. And then the last one, and since Tesla is well known, I've used them to represent the lithium ion battery. So let me just tell you a little bit real quickly about each one of these battery technologies. And uh, I'm gonna do this kind of quickly, but I'm happy to come back and elaborate on things. So starting off with the lead acid battery. So everybody depends upon lead acid batteries. They're literally under the hood of every single car and have been since the 1920s when they became the starter battery for, for gasoline cars. If you're an electric car owner and you're thinking, nope, you know, I actually don't have a lead acid battery. Well, in fact, you do. Even electric cars also have a lead acid battery, which is used for um, various purposes in the vehicle. So they have been crucial to the ability to easily turn on cars and to travel in um, both for cars and other forms of transportation as well. They've also been used as backup systems for lots of um, utility scale applications like telephone systems and electrical grids on a small scale as well. Historically, a couple of interesting facts about lead acid batteries. I mean, one, they're obviously toxic because they have lead in them. Another more interesting fact is that they are these, at this point in time, they're the single most recycled product in the world. In the US, more than 99% of lead acid batteries are recovered and recycled. So if you're looking for a model of recycling, the lead acid battery is a really good model. And that's not something new. We've actually been recycling lead acid batteries on an industrial scale since the 1930s. What has changed from the 1930s to present is how efficient the recycling system is. At this point, almost every part of a lead acid battery is captured and reused. That would include the lead, the sulfuric acid, and the plastic battery casing. So if you're looking for a model of kind of a circular economy, the lead acid battery offers a really interesting model. So that's a little bit about the lead acid battery. The AA, AAA, the al and these are alkaline manganese batteries. And you know, as you know, right, these are used in their disposable batteries, used in flashlights, radios, portable electronics, remote controls. Should probably add kids' toys to this list. Um, I know I've bought a lot more <laughs> since I, kids have become a part of my life. The alkaline bat manganese batteries are really fascinating. On the one hand, they represent kind of a little known but really important environmental success story. In the 1980s, alkaline batteries were the largest source of mercury in the nation's waste stream, and this became a concern. And from the late 1980s to the mid-1990s, largely at the initiative of the battery industry, they managed to eliminate all of the mercury from these batteries. And that you saw a significant drop in mercury in the waste stream as a result. So in some respects, a really important success story. But other interesting facts about the alkaline manganese batteries, they are extraordinarily energy intensive. It takes about 160 times more energy to manufacture one than you actually get when you use it. And partly because of this energy intensity, that also makes it very polluting. On a kind of per unit energy basis, it is 40 times more greenhouse gas intensive polluting than as a coal fired power plant. So if you're wondering kind of what the most kind of polluting force in, a form of energy is, I mean, this alkaline battery would be a strong argument um, for that. 
and it's also expensive, at least measured on a per unit basis. You pay about 500 times more for the energy that's contained in that little AA battery than you would pay if you could actually just get that energy off of the electrical grid. So, I mean, that kind of begs the question, well, why in the world do we use these things? It's not because they have a whole lot of energy in them. It's that they're, it's a really useful energy, right? You can open up an alkaline battery that's been sitting there for 10 years and it will still function if it is new. And that quality and that reliability is something that we value greatly. So lead acid batteries, their history starts in the early 20th century. Alkaline batteries are kind of a more, um, a newer version of an older zinc carbon battery, but they've been around since the 1960s and their uh, antecedent, the zinc carbon batteries, they were around since the start of the 20th century. Those are kind of the two dominant uh, battery chemistries for much of the 20th century. But the lithium ion batteries have become central to how we use batteries and also how we think about the future since they were first put on the market, uh, which was in 1991. So they have a much shorter history. Um, lithium ion batteries are in all of the devices that we're probably all using right now, right? The laptops, the tablets, the smartphones, um, they are the rechargeable battery technology in almost all modern electronics. They've also been scaled up and now all of the electric cars that are being put on the market rely upon lithium ion batteries. And they're also now being scaled up to an even larger um, scale and used in utility projects where they're providing backup power for um, kind of on the scale of uh, small power plants. So what's interesting about lithium ion batteries? So they're much more energy dense than a lead acid battery, which is why they can do something like uh, power an electric car. We call them lithium batteries, lithium ion batteries, I should say, but the lithium content is actually relatively small, uh, often less than 2%. And the lithium ion batteries rely on a whole lot of other active materials, materials like cobalt and nickel and graphite, just to list off a few. Unlike the AA and the lead acid battery industries, which had a very strong and a large domestic footprint. Most of the manufacturing of lithium ion batteries has been in Asia, in Japan, South Korea, in China. And unlike that lead acid battery, which is so highly recyclable, that's proven very difficult with lithium ion batteries. So they're difficult to recycle. But if we're thinking about which batteries we're, we're going to be using more and more of in the future, the lithium ion battery is at the top of that list. So I just wanted to give you a little bit about kind of these different, um, kind of try and say a couple of interesting things about each one of these case studies. I'm happy to come back to them. Um, but in investigating them, a big part of this project is understanding where the materials come from, how they're refined and how they get packaged into you know, these useful technologies that we use and who's involved in that work. And so a big part of this project is actually, I feel like I've been on a tour of the periodic table for the last couple of years trying to understand where materials like lead come from. And so one of the places, I'm just going to drink water. One of the places that's been central to the history of the lead industry is Missouri. Missouri has produced more lead out of its old and new lead districts than any other place in the United States. And it's one of the largest uh, lead producing regions in the world. And there is a long history, both of environmental pollution, um, which impacted the communities, largely poor communities, near these mines, and these were mining towns, so people were living right up against the mines. And, and then there's also been a history of remediation, as we've seen efforts to actually try and restore and manage the public health threats that were left behind by the lead industry. So there's a long history of lead mining and the consequences of that for people who lived in these communities where you know children had very high lead levels. Um, right up until the 1990s. There's been a real shift though, as our environmental laws in the United States have become tighter. We've seen the lead industry slowly shut down. And so at this point, there's still some lead mining happening in Missouri, but almost all of the processing has been sent overseas, much of it going to Asia. 
And so, you know, seeing a shift where we're outsourcing the social and environmental costs, much of them of lead to other countries. So lead is obviously important to lead acid batteries. If we're thinking about the lithium ion batteries, Lithium is important and the extraction of lithium, as you would expect, has skyrocketed since the early 1990s, been driven largely by demand for batteries. There are two really important places where lithium is mined on an industrial scale. One is in the salt flats in South America and countries in the Atacama Desert in Chile and then in Argentina and perhaps one day in Bolivia. And so this is a picture of the Solar de Atacama, and it shows the lithium mines of a company called SQM. And what's interesting about lithium is it's not hard rock mining. It's about pumping a brine up from beneath these salt flats that you then allow over the course of a year to go through a series of evaporation phases before it can be processed into a raw material suitable, suitable for use in batteries. As the industry has expanded, especially in Chile, there's been a lot of opposition from local indigenous groups that are concerned about the impacts uh, on their agricultural communities, their access to water, and that's slowed down, especially in Argentina, the development of more lithium mines, whereas they've, um, you know, the lithium mining companies have had more success expanding in Chile. Almost all of the lithium batteries that we rely upon right now depend upon cobalt. They actually use more cobalt than they do lithium. And as the battery industry has expanded the uh, demand for lithium ion batteries, much of the growth in the industry has been supplied by mines in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Since Civil War ended there in the country, somewhat stabilized. Um, starting in the early 21st century. One of the ways in which they sought to stabilize the economy was further expanding the mining industry, largely by bringing in multinational firms to do that work. And so about 80% of the cobalt production from the DRC comes from kind of industrial mines, but about 20% of it comes from artisanal mines where people are doing work, kind of hand labor, to mine, process, and produce, con uh, produce cobalt that can go on the market. And one of the significant concerns is that there is um, a sizable percentage of the production that is tied to child labor, as you can see in this picture. And so, you know, thinking about the sustainability of lithium ion batteries, the sourcing of cobalt has been a major concern and one that's been a concern for um, environmentalists and social justice advoc advocates since the late kind of 2007, 2008, that's become a growing concern. And then less kind of paid attention to, but really important is that all of these batteries, but especially the lithium ion batteries, actually I shouldn't say all the batteries, the um, disposable AA batteries and the lithium ion batteries share in common that they rely upon graphite for uh, their anode. And graphite, that is used is almost entirely produced in China and produced in the Shandong province and produced in it where the mining activities are layered on top of uh, existing agricultural um, regions. And so as demand for batteries has grown, especially with that turn towards lithium ion batteries, there's been a significant industrial development in this agricultural region. And the way that the graphite is processed. It has to be processed into something called spherical graphite. And if you look at it under an electron microscope or you look at a picture of this, which is what I've done, it looks like little ball, you know, potato balls that are a few nanometers wide. Processing the graphite into sphere, spherical graphite is a very wasteful process. And the graphite uh, escapes. It um, becomes fugitive dust in this processing. And one of the things about graphite is you can literally see this pollution. It's, uh, it kind of looks like a shimmering um, snowflakes that are in the air. And, you know, and so it looks sort of pretty when it's in the air, but uh, in, these agricultural, in this agricultural region of China, there's been much opposition and mobilization of the local residents, villagers, farmers against the graphite industry, which has been expanding to meet the demand of the battery industry. So these are some of the kinds of um, 
stories that I've learned that, you know, when you look at an engineering report about the life cycle analysis of a lithium ion battery, these are the kinds of stories about production and who is engaged and affected by the production of these materials that often fall out of the analysis about stories that I've been trying to bring into this project. Okay, so I'm going to move to just three kind of lessons that I'm beginning to draw from this project and then I'm going to stop. So the first lesson that I want to emphasize is the one that I started with, which is that moving to a clean energy future will require a massive increase in materials use. And it's not a challenge that we can recycle our way out of. And the reason I say this is because back in June 2017, the World Bank put out a report really trying to think about how developing countries could grow their economies to provide the minerals and metals for a low carbon future. And then people were very skeptical of this uh, with the World Bank kind of leading the charge. And uh, a bunch of environmental groups sent a letter to the CEO of the World Bank raising concerns about this program. And I just want to highlight what they emphasize, or one of their points that they emphasize. They said, we urge the World Bank Group to prioritize recycling efficiency, circular economy, public transit, and other non-mining solutions is the primary components of its climate smart agenda, which is all well and good, right? We should recycle and invest in the technology and the infrastructure to do that. But it is very clear that if we're going to move to a clean energy future, that we are going to need massive amounts of materials from places like the Congo and Chile and China and the United States as well to do that. We can't simply recycle our way out of it because there are not enough, not near enough of these materials already in circulation. And the second lesson is that, you know, not surprisingly, these extractive industries disproportionately impact people of color and the poor and that those impacts are being exacerbated as extraction shifts abroad. So telling stories that help people understand and think about and begin to develop the kinds of regulations and programs we need to ensure that the social justice, the environmental justice, the working conditions are factored in as we think about you know, what a sustainable and just future looks like. That's an important lesson that emerges from examining this environmental history of batteries. This graph, which I think I'm just going to move through real quickly, just shows that that's something that's becoming more important as we're relying on more resources from abroad. So which all of these negative bars show is how much less aluminum, copper, and zinc we're producing in the United States now than we were in 2000. And then the last lesson I draw here is kind of a broader lesson about kind of what we think of as kind of environmental concern, uh, environmentalism. And I want to emphasize, you know, I think we need to move towards kind of a more materially, materially aware environmentalism. And kind of to explain this, I'll just return to where we started, which because I do think this is exemplified by the Green New Deal. You know, for all the proponents of the Green New Deal have had to say about a clean energy future and social justice and a more equitable society, the resolution itself and the supporters really haven't had a whole lot to say about the nitty gritty work of sourcing the materials for the technologies that they're advocating. Now, and I think, you know, the Green New Deal was conceived of as a political platform, kind of a moonshot to meet the challenge of climate change and social justice issues, you know, more so than a concrete plan of action. So kind of this inattention to the practicalities may not be entirely surprising. But I, I do think that there's a real lack of attention that, or this lack of attention really stem, stems from a deep aversion to wrestling with the material consequences of, uh, you know, of a clean energy future, um, both within the sustainability and the environmental community. So just one last thought here, which is you now closed by emphasizing that I think just as the climate challenge requires careful forethought and aggressive action, so too does building the mines, the supply chains, and the recycling infrastructure needed to enable a sustainable and just clean energy future. Okay, I will stop there. Eric, I hope uh, that gives you enough to give some comments and raise some questions. Turn off my share and I'll turn it over. 
Great. Uh, thank you so much, Jay. This is such a fascinating project. Uh, it's given me a lot to think about. Uh, I'm, I'm Eric Mathis. I'm a professor in the philosophy department, and I'm the faculty director of the Frost Center for the Environment. And so I wanted to, I mean, there are a lot of people in the room, and I'm sure people have a lot of questions. So I want to be brief and just sort of ask, I think, two questions that pick up on themes that, that Jay's already talked about um, in, in his presentation and that I'm, I'm curious to hear, hear more about. So the first question, I guess, is somewhat of a methodological question about how one uh, engages in doing the history of something like a battery that, as you've explained, goes through so many significant sort of material technological changes. So when you look at the disanalogies, for instance, between the recyclability of a lead acid battery and the non-recyclability of the lithium ion, ion battery, sort of methodologically, how do you draw lessons from Right, the history of the battery use in the lead acid case and sort of apply it to the very different challenges that we face given the technological differences with a with a lithium ion battery. So when you were talking, I was, you know, I was watching you talk and I was thinking about the the lithium ion batteries in your AirPods, right? So I I also have AirPods, right? They all have lithium ion batteries in them. Uh, and not only are they not very recyclable, but they also are so they've gotten so tiny and are easily di disposable. Um, disposable, not, not in a good way, right? They get lost, they get thrown out, uh, and they don't last very long. Um, and so I wonder about sort of how you draw lessons from the sort of very different technology of the lead acid battery and thinking about the lithium ion battery. And that, that actually ties into my, my other question, which is sort of about the, I guess sort of the par partially the bigger picture in thinking about batteries in relation to, uh, to climate change. So this was also sort of Bond by thinking about the, the AirPods. Um, and that is, you know, according to, you know, one important uh, thread in uh, analysis of climate change, the problem of climate change is inextricably linked with problems associated with capitalism and with colonialism. Uh, and we saw these threads coming up in your, in your talk in important ways. Um, and so I wanted to invite you to sort of talk more about some of the the worries, not just about the impacts of batteries through mining, for instance, um, but also about how batteries figure into the kind of approach that people take towards the problem of climate change. Because I think there's a worry that due to the success of things like the lithium ion battery, people might uh, make the assumption that we can maintain a kind of right, highly consumerist culture right, that we have and address the problem of climate change at the same time, right? That we can sort of switch over our energy sources to renewable sources, aided by lithium ion batteries, and there will be no, uh, you know, correlate sacrifices in the nature of our consumer behavior, uh, and we can, you know, have a sort of a happy uh, marriage between uh, uh, continuing forces of capitalism and uh, a future in which we address climate change problems. So. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about sort of how the, the battery might play a role in sort of shaping public perspectives about that possibility in contrast with approaches to climate change that might involve more uh, sacrifice both at the, at the institutional and the, and the systemic level. Yeah, thanks both for the comments and shaping them into questions as well. Um, Yes, let me take both of them and uh, try not to be too long because I'd love to hear other questions and comments from other people as well. I mean, methodologically, this project has been hard. It's definitely been the hardest project. Um, it, it made me wish that I had also gotten my PhD in chemistry, which I do not think <laughs> I could actually have uh, ever pulled off. Um, but so, you know, so there have been challenges understanding, you know, the chemistry of batteries, figuring out how to tell stories about that. And it's not just the chemistry, but I mean, one of the things I've really come to have an appreciation for is just the, you know, the complexity of materials. Right? When you talk about something like lithium, I mean, that's just the beginning of the story. There are five steps before that lithium winds up getting packaged into a battery cell and then assembled into a battery pack. Um, so, so in you know, my, my methodology is drawn from a field which is called envirotechnical analysis. And one of the goals of enviro envirotechnical analysis is to kind of set aside kind of what we think of as being natural and artificial and 
understand that materials kind of move between these very familiar categories. Um, and so I've really you know, tried to kind of blur um, the boundaries. You know, often we think of minds as something that are kind of imposed on nature, but you know, that looks different if you think of your mind not actually being nature. But in the case of lead acid batteries, the mind is actually the built environment around us, right? That's where all the lead comes from um, because they're so highly recycled. So methodologically, that's kind of the um, kind of subfield in environmental history that I've relied on the most. You know, how do you draw lessons from this? I mean, you know, in the case you brought up the lead acid battery and kind of how recyclable it was. And it's a really interesting story because it has such a long history. And I think there's a lot to be learned about when recycling does succeed from the lead acid battery. You know, just real quickly there, right? Lead was toxic. Right, so there was a strong interest um, that ramped up in the 1960s for keeping lead out of the waste stream and out of people's bodies. Right, so that provided a regulatory impetus for recycling them. It turns out that it's cost effective to recycle lead. It's cheaper to get it from that car to your recycling plant and back to a ba battery manufacturer than it is to actually you know, get it from a traditional mine. So there was also an economic imperative but you know, kind of the comparison to the AirPods, the lead acid battery is this big hulking 20 pound thing, right? That you never want to pull out of your car. And they're all the same size for the most part, right? So they're a very standardized commodity with a very standardized chemistry, which makes them relatively easy to recycle. So there are lots of reasons we should expect lead acid batteries to be recycled at a large scale. I should also say that that's not the case in all parts of the world. And so part of the story is understanding how this kind of the recycling industry um, has failed in other countries that haven't had the strong environmental regulations there. And there I'm mean, gonna have a whole kind of column in my research, which is I just labeled horror stories because there are all sorts of just really um, just hard stories about what has happened when um, small scale lead acid battery recycling has sickened entire communities. Um, but I think, you know, there, kind of methodologically, there's some really important lessons where you can draw a contrast between what made recycling work in that case, which helps us better understand the challenges for recycling this newer generation of uh, battery technologies, which are becoming even more common. And I guess just one last point there is lithium ion batteries actually come in a whole bunch of different flavors. Um, unlike a lead acid battery, which is quite standardized. And every one of those flavors needs a little bit different recycling approach. So, you know, recycling the battery from your AirPods is likely going to take a slightly different process than recycling the battery from a uh, Chevrolet Bolt electric car. But you asked a bigger question, a really interesting question about how we think about climate change more broadly. And you know, two points come to mind here. I think that the history, the way I'm telling the history of the lithium ion battery in this book is connected to kind of the acceleration of kind of, of globalization uh, after the 1990s spurred on by neoliberalism and efforts to help countries kind of led by the World Bank to grow economies by, you know, welcoming multinational uh, firms into their countries to extract resources, to commodify them and put them on the market without internalizing the costs of doing so, right? Either for workers or the environmental costs of doing this. And you know, the lithium ion battery more so than these other battery technologies draws on materials from all around the world. And so the kind of embrace of the mining industry and then the opposition to it as well, you know, to understand that and, Chile or in the DRC, you know, thinking about it in the context of how the global economy is changing is useful. And in part, it's kind of this, uh, you know, an acceleration of extractive industries post 1990s. And it's also about the rise of manufacturing in Asia um, on the heels of the consumer electronics industry. So, you know, that's where the lithium ion batteries begin to be manufactured at scale, which then drives down the price of batteries, which makes it possible to begin to put them into things like cars. And so understanding how manufacturing was being uh, 
you know, reworked, you know, the ways in which companies like you know, I use an Apple computer, like Apple no longer makes any computers in the US, they outsource it to Foxconn, right? Understanding that ties into understanding how the global economy was making the lithium ion battery possible. But to take that bigger step back, well, how does that fit into how we you know, think about you know, addressing climate change? I mean, I think, I think you're right. It narrows how we think about addressing climate change. And there's a group um, at a, kind of a think tank called the Breakthrough Institute that kind of take this to the nth degree. And they're the technological optimists where they say, you know, addressing climate change, the only way to do this is really by embracing technology and inventing our way out of this. And so they would hold up the lithium ion battery and these other renewable energy technologies is really the most feasible way. It's not going to involve a fundamental shift in kind of society. We want everybody to have these technologies. That's going to be the way forward. Um, and, you know, and there's, you know, so I think they're the ones who have kind of ad advanced this um, vision for the future kind of most aggressively. And although I don't think people would give them credit for it. I mean, I think the Green New Deal is very much aligned with that vision, right? We're not going to reduce consumption. We're going to change consumption. We're going to make consumption and production, you know, these systems more uh, socially equitable and, and just. I think you know, that has narrowed the conversation, right? There's not as much discussion about kind of a degrowth agenda. And you know, there is a community of scholars, especially and activists who have countered the kind of breakthrough institute and its kind of optimistic visions of the future saying, no, we need to fundamentally rethink capitalism and think about how to localize systems, localize the world to shrink economies, not expand economies. And right, that doesn't, you know, that, that line of thought has been drowned out, I think. Um, especially in these broader national discussions of addressing climate change. So I think, you know, to the extent that the lithium ion battery fits in, it fits into that, you know, that strand of technological optimism that groups like the Breakthrough Institute have been advocating. So those are a couple of thoughts, but um, welcome comments, questions, suggestions for a title, things people would like to hear more about from, from anybody. Dina. Hi, I first want to say thank you so much for such a wonderful discussion. It really made me think about so many things that I, I wasn't even thinking about like an hour ago. So it really brought so many things like and in my perspective. So I really appreciate um, this talk. Um, so we know there is a huge need for materials, a huge need for batteries in the future. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sustainable sourcing. I know sustainable sourcing is like a buzzword, like people even talk about like green coal, which like is not true, but people like to talk about these issues a lot um, in terms of like energy production and material sourcing. And so I was wondering for things like lithium and cobalt and graphite, is sustainable sourcing a possibility? Yeah, it's a great question. And this kind of goes to my third point about kind of wanting, needing a more material environmentalism. You know, I think if you kind of look back at your concern about the environment over the last 15 years, right, there's a lot of concern about climate change, but there's also been a lot of concern about agriculture, right? And that's been a really galvanizing issue where there's been a lot of thought about where food comes from, how food is produced, who are the workers who are involved in producing the food, what are the consequences of that? And I think you know, that offer, you know, kind of that uh, level of engagement and awareness, you know, offers a model for that sort of concern that we should also be bringing to things like lithium and cobalt and graphite um, as well. And so, you know, to your question, there are there are some efforts to provide ways to track how these materials are sourced. Um, I mean, so one is there in 2010, out of concern about what was happening in the Democratic, um, in the DRC, there was a policy act, act passed in the US Congress and in the EU that required companies to disclose if they were sourcing minerals. Um, under conflict minerals um, kind of legislation. And so there have been efforts like that when there's a clear tie between minerals. And in that case, it actually wasn't any of the materials that are used in batteries. It was um, 
um, tantalum and tin and a few other materials. So that's one avenue. Another, uh, you know, so it's a policy approach. Another are third party certification programs. And there is some work to provide a certification program for responsible mining operations. There's been efforts to develop this over the last 10 years. So it's something that's growing and needs more support. Um, but that's another avenue, right, to have third party groups do audits and certify that a mine is operating in a way that's consistent with a certain set of um, guidelines. And so it's really just been in the last decade that that has begun to, begun to um, gain momentum. The, uh, in the last you know, this comment I'll offer here is one that goes back to that lead acid battery because, you know, we really could have used those kinds of certifications historically because the lead industry uh, imposed enormous social and environmental costs on the communities that are close to where the lead was mined and where it was recycled. The interesting thing about a lead acid battery is when you think about those third party certifications, right, sustainable sourcing, you assume it comes from, say, a mine and it you know, winds up in a product and you can follow it at each step along the way. But what becomes interesting with the lead acid battery is that the lead is so highly recycled, right? And these lead acid batteries in your car last for five years that one molecule of lead, you know, at this point, because it's so highly recycled, you know, it could have been circulating in these batteries for decades. And so when you're thinking about kind of certifying that it's sustainable, was that just from when it was last recycled? Or do we also need to be thinking about the historical uh, legacies of the lead industry in the place that the, that lead molecule may have been sourced from, you know, two or three or four decades in the past? So kind of as the system becomes more circular and more recycling, or more, and there's more recycling, it kind of raises you know, questions about what it actually means to certify that the material and how the material was sourced. Um, but yeah, so this is an interesting question. It gets me thinking about lots of things. Jill, I see your hands up. Yeah, thank you so much for um, giving this talk today. Something that I I'm interested in is that you have used the word recycling a lot, but I know that recycling can mean a lot of very different things. Cause right. There's like for, I know a lot more about recycling for plastics, but right. You have mechanical recycling, chemical recycling, but then there's also downcycling, right. That like oftentimes with materials, when you recycle them, you don't get this. It's not a one-to-one -one situation. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like, the recycling of batteries and what that actually entails, because I think that something that I kind of was been wondering about in your talk is you're saying like the lead is reused a lot, but like, what about the acid part or like, cause I know that that can also have implications to the environment or for lithium ion batteries. When you say recycling is difficult, is it because of the fact that like getting the lithium back so that you can use it one-to-one -one as they do with the lead is difficult or is it because of other types of challenges? Yeah, that's another really good question. So it makes me think about the middle case study, which are those AA batteries, because there's been a long standing interest in recycling those batteries, right? People, I don't know, there's something about those batteries, people don't like to throw them away. I don't know. I mean, how many people <laughs> have a bucket, a, you know, a yogurt container or a box, or I'm seeing hands popping up, right? Because they haven't wanted to throw those batteries away. And actually back in 2000 and since 2006, the big disposable battery manufacturers made a goal to actually build a recycling infrastructure for these batteries um, so that you could actually kind of on a national scale recycle all of them. And so Jill, to your point, the, the problem it turns out is that actually recycling those batteries takes more energy and generates more pollution than does just sourcing the material from a mine in the first place. They don't have an efficient recycling um, technology. And in part, that's because the materials that they recover from these recycled batteries is almost always a form of downcycling. It winds up in what's called slag, which then goes in as a binder and asphalt and gets put into roads. Uh, it turns the, the zinc and the uh, manganese wind up as agricultural amendments. It winds up as a form of fertilizer, which is a pretty low quality use. It doesn't actually go back into batteries. And so, you know, what we think of as recycling those batteries is very much a form of downcycling. 
And if you've got those boxes of batteries, I, it took me a long time to get to this point, but I, I put them in the trash. Not all at once, just kind of one or two at a time to kind of spread them out. Um, recycling them isn't uh, a useful thing to do. And in part, it's because we have to transport them so far to actually get them to the recycling centers. But with the lead acid batteries, I mean, that, that industry really has succeeded in building a circular supply chain where the lead is going back, the acid is going back and being reused, and even the pellets at this point are being reused to make new battery cases. I mean, so on the one hand, right, that sounds like a model of sustainability, and this is a model that the industry's honed over the last 30 years, where literally the, the same trucks that leave the battery factory that go to the, I guess the Walmart probably to drop off the new batteries, they pick up the used batteries there, take them to the lead recycler. And when they're at the lead recycler, they pick up the lead that's been recycled to take to the battery manufacturer. It's called a tolling process. And it's uh, you know, very well organized at this point. Um, so on the one hand, right, that sounds, you know, like a model of sustainability. The problem is that there are persistent issues with pollution from the lead acid battery recycling facilities. And often these are located in, you know, places like East Los Angeles near, you know, densely populated areas. And so you have communities that are being, you know, suffering the health consequences of this. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, there's a real contrast between the lead acid battery and the alkaline batteries on recycling. And I think, you know, with the lithium ion batteries, that is a big question. You know, how are we going to find a way, or they, the people who are going to do this, you know, to recycle these in a way that is energy efficient and isn't a form of downcycling? And at least to date, there's not been a whole lot of success in doing that. But we also know that one of the reasons the lead acid battery succeeded is because there were lots of those batteries and they were, um, kind of a durable good right coming out of a car and that's what's going to be happening with lithium ion batteries so there's a real opportunity to build a lithium ion recycling industry at scale but i think you know that's one of the big projects that um you know needs to be undertaken at the same time that you know companies like tesla and gm are talking about you know building gigafactories to make the batteries somebody needs to be figuring out how to make the you know gigafactory to recycle the thing as well yeah, thank you so much for your answer. I think actually one of the things that you bring up that is really interesting of the question of how we do this when you lithium ion batteries are so embedded in other technologies that I think that there are a lot more layers of challenge than, you know, pulling out a car battery, which is something you can still do for the most part. Agreed. Other comments, questions? Yes, I have a question. Hi, Jake. Thank you so much for this really wonderful talk. I really appreciate being able to join in on this. Good um, to see you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I have a question about the idea of extracting these um, products from the earth in order to um, to make the products we need for the Green New Deal. And is there worry about running out, about stripping the earth of these chemicals, of these minerals, of these, you know, products that we will need in order to move forward with the Green New Deal? Thank you. Yeah, that's also a really good question. And, you know, if you study the history of materials extraction, mining, you know, predictions about, about when we're going to reach, you know, peak this material or peak that material, you know, one of the lessons that becomes clear is that as the economics and the technology change, you know, our ability, um, both the demand for products or willingness to pay for materials that often goes up, but also the efficiency with which we can extract the materials from lower and lower um, grade sources, that increases as well. So, you know, that said, I guess some kind of the point there is often it turns out to be more lithium or manganese than, than you expect. The projections though are clear that, you know, at the scale that we're, you know, that kind of the Green New Deal projects we need to deploy these technologies, right? If we're gonna be electrifying all of the cars in the world, the 2 billion cars in the world, we will run up against the limits of the amount of lithium that's readily extractable or the amount of 
cobalt um, and nickel that are readily extract extractable. We'll be taxing those resources, which doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to run out of them, but it means that we may need to use more energy to, ex to extract them um, because you'll be getting them from a lower grade source. And the challenge there is well, using more energy to extract it means that there's likely going to be more of a well, there's more of an energy investment, so you need more energy to do it, renewable energy to do it, and that's a huge challenge. How do you extract these materials and refine them using renewable energy technologies? Um, but often processing those materials to the level of purity, and that's one thing that I haven't really emphasized, but you know, batteries, the electrochemical performance of them relies uh, on precision, on purity on um, extremely pure materials are often doped in very specific ways with additives. And so you need to take these resources and refine them to a very high level. And so often the more pure the material you want, the greater the energy investment and the environmental consequences are of doing so. You know, so I think, you know, is maybe more interesting to me even than are we going to run out or not is you know, how do we transition these extractive industries in a way that they actually rely on renewable energy as well right um, and i think that's an equally enormous challenge when you're thinking about processing um you know metals like cobalt and graphite and even lithium, which require high temperature kind of heating uh, processes as part of that work. So those are you know, some of the, you know, the big challenges that come with sourcing the materials. Eve. Yeah, um, I have a, yeah, I think I'm live. Um, so I have a question about, again, going back to methodologies and how you do your work. I love the image of you running back and forth from one library to another on campus. But my question is, um, when, you're, when you're thinking about archival work and you're thinking about how you tell the story that you're telling, when it comes to the effects of these issues on communities of color and disenfranchised groups, how do you, how do you learn about this? I mean, are you, and, and to what extent does your research involve um, communication working with activists? activists? on the ground and and how do you how do you tell how do you access the 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 voices to make sure that they are accounted for in your work that's also a really important and interesting question and it depends um and you know, one of that you know so one goal here is i'm working on a book, which I'm envisioning is actually a pretty short <laughs> book. Um, so not kind of the canonical version of any one of these stories that I'm telling. Um, and you know, so I've taken a whole bunch of different strategies and ones that I, you know, and I've not always been wearing my historian's hat. I think this being my, my third project, I've you know, started to think of myself as much as an environmental studies scholar that is really trying to pull information from wherever I can find it. So in some cases, you know, one of my case studies is a lead smelter in East Los Angeles, the Exide lead smelter. And there I went and met and talked with people on the ground, met with activists and did archival research and did the things that you would expect a historian normally to do. Um, in other cases, you know, trying to investigate the consequences of the graphite industry. And in China, it's been relying on the work of NGOs who have been on the ground and been bringing this information, you know, spotlighting this information. It's been relying on Google Translate and spending hours upon hours going through Chinese language newspapers and government publicity and you know, understanding that, you know, the story in China is, you know, much more complicated than usually reported, where these activists are, you know, succeeding in pressuring the local governments to institute environmental reforms. You know, so in some cases, you know, I'm kind of taking advantage of all the tools on the, um, you know, available to us now to try and piece together these stories. And I guess those are kind of the two ends of the spectrum for me, but, but I've been very opportunistic. Um, in trying to assemble the information for this project and have definitely gone well beyond kind of what I, you know, the archival research that I did when I was working on my dissertation.
I think we're getting close to the, the end of time here, but maybe you know, if there's time for another question or two. Or maybe that's a good place to leave it. Yeah, we don't want to exhaust you because uh, you, you obviously need, need uh, to have a lot to do. Uh, uh, thank you for an absolutely illuminating presentation, may I say. I, I feel that sometimes I spend hours and I don't know what I have done, but today I know that I spent a wonderful hour uh, listening to you talk about your work. And thank you so much to every one of you for coming. Um, and we invite you back again. Eric, director of the Center for the Environment, the Frost Center for the Environment, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you.